Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Today I'm joined by Ben Pearson for a short interview on Ultima Thule, the Kuiper Belt object that the New Horizons probe is passing by over the new year. Ben is a graduate of the University of Arizona and has been involved in aerospace projects including the high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Ben is also known for tracking space objects, including Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster. Ben Pearson, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Now, Ben, what you do is you you track things. You track things in space. Um, it's what I'm becoming known for. Indeed, indeed. And uh, I remember you tracked the uh, space Roadster, the Tesla, and then now we you were talking about Ultima Thule. Now. Mm-hmm. What? How was this thing detected? As I recall, this thing was detected specifically as a, you know looking for a target for the New Horizons spacecraft. How did they find this thing? Right. So ever since the mission was launched, it has been the desire to have it fly by a Kuiper Belt object of some form after it made the flyby to Pluto. The spacecraft was designed with that in mind, and they knew that there should be some that were out there that it could do it, but none of them had actually been detected when it was launched. So they spent many years trying to use ground-based telescopes to find something to target. But the problem is, is the part of the sky that New Horizons is flying towards is kind of towards the galactic background, the galactic center. And as a result, it's very, very difficult for ground-based telescopes to detect something as dim as one of these relatively small rocks that are out in deep space. So eventually, they had to turn to the Hubble Space Telescope to detect it, and the Hubble Space Telescope detected the object that they're flying by in 2014. Now, this object is... is it's hard to it's hard to state how small it is. Um, it's a relatively tiny object. So what detecting this is like detecting almost a needle in a haystack, right? Right. I did the math. I mean, it's something along the lines of a bullseye as seen from tiny, tiny object that's out there. And it's going to be very, very dim because it's so far out that the sun doesn't have a whole lot of light to reflect off of. So it's very difficult to detect this. There's only one telescope in the vicinity of Earth that is able to detect it, and that is the Hubble Space Telescope. They have never been able to detect it through a ground-based observation. Now, this is because Earth's atmosphere is has some opacity to it, so you can't just, even if you have an enormous telescope, you you, you can't even see this object from the Earth's surface, but you need Hubble to see it. Um, now, we have a picture of this object, a preliminary one. Obviously, we're going to have much better pictures as the days uh, go on. But right. It looks really, really elongated. What yeah. uh, What are your observations on that? I mean, it's pretty typical. The thought has been that it was some kind of a peanut-type shaped object using some of the, the early occultation data where they actually track the shadow that this object cast from a couple of stars from Earth, they kind of sense that it was an elongated type object. And it's a very common type of shape for these tiny solar system objects. So sort of like uh, two objects maybe that came together and sort of um, just touched maybe. Yeah, the contact binary, that's one theory. There's a lot of different shapes that are out there. The uh, the Rosetta mission flew by a comet that I'm not going to try to pronounce its name, but it really kind of looked like two objects that were contacted together. And it, this is a little bit more elongated than that, but it's still pretty interesting. Right. And this is, um, I think the most interesting part of this for me is how pristine this object is. It's yeah. literally a time capsule from the early solar system and could you know they could detect organics on it they could detect almost you know just all sorts of interesting things that could have implications for the origins of life on earth for example with organic chemistry now so the the whole point of new horizons originally was to fly past pluto correct how do you get from pluto to ultima thule So basically they had to, first they had to find it and we already talked about how they did that. And then they had to figure out exactly where it was. Now they knew from the initial observation that they could get relatively close using a couple of burns. As I recall, there were 
four objects that they could reach. This one was actually the one that used the least amount of fuel for them to get to. So they have enough onboard fuel that they could burn and, and make it there. And they had enough to make a course correction for this. So during the months at, immediately after the Pluto flyby, they did a number of burns. I believe it was four of them to correct the course to be flying by this this Kuiper Belt object as opposed to just continuing on its its trajectory otherwise. Then they had to refine the trajectory because they're the better you know the trajectory, the better the images you can get and the closer you can fly by. You're not going to fly by an object very close if you don't know exactly where it is. So they were able to refine the trajectory. The latest I heard was about three kilometers off of an error bar which is absolutely astounding considering that vast distance between the two. And hopefully the pictures will turn out really nice. Yeah, it's a sort of astonishing because you, you go from, I mean, the exactness that you have to have to go from Pluto to this object is, is astonishing. Um, now with Pluto, we found that it was a far more interesting object than anyone could have imagined. You know, all sorts of things were discovered at Pluto. And I'm hoping that this is the case with Ultima Thule. Now, um, what's next? People are talking about maybe that we can go to another Kuiper Belt object. So what's what's next for New Horizons? So Alan Stern, the principal investigator, has said that there's an, about the same amount of fuel on board that there was to make the correction from Pluto to, to Ultima Thule. And so, in theory, there's enough to do another flyby. Now, we don't actually have any candidate objects that it could do this, and we haven't been detecting them. The This object was detected about a year before the Pluto flyby, but it should still be in contact for a number of years, and we could still continue to do this. The real trick is, is how would you find it? It took the Hubble Space Telescope for us to observe this object. And even further out there, you know, this was a six-minute integration effort to look for something that we didn't even know if it was out there. It would probably take an even longer time period to detect something from Hubble. So they're actually talking of using the onboard camera, uh, Lori is the name of it, to try to search for for different potential candidates out there. So actually using the camera on the spacecraft itself? I hadn't heard That's that. That's correct. Interesting. So... Um... I guess they would do time-lapse photography, looking for anything that's moving, I, s I suppose? Yeah, and they have been doing some extent of that. I remember some of the earlier pictures that they took, you could see different objects that were moving in the background, and and that's really what they do with Hubble anyways, is they take the pictures and look for what's moving. That's going to be a potentially a lot, of, uh, a lot of bang for the buck, if you think about it, because all this spacecraft was designed for was to just look at Pluto and be done with it. And here it is in the outer solar system looking at Kuiper Belt objects. Now, how close is it, was it supposed to pass to Ultima Thule? Um, about 3,500 kilometers from memory. So relatively close, you know, yeah. given the distances. So there should be some pretty decent close-up photos of it if, um, if all, you know, downloads well. Of course, that may be weeks before we see that, but... Um... Yeah. So what they're going to do is they're going to download all of the metadata first, and then hopefully that will tell them what images actually have something of, of real value. Now, they, they kind of set their observations in different uh, resolutions. So um, the two that we've seen, the two contingency images, show a little bit of interesting data. And as it gets closer, then they're going to do another relatively high resolution one that's probably on the ground right now and will be released, I suspect, tomorrow. There's another even higher resolution one that's going to come back sometime in the early morning hours of tomorrow, and that one might be released too. That will give us a pretty good idea of the whole body type of look for this. And then they're going to try to take some pictures at the highest resolution point, but basically they have to hit the timing perfectly to do this. And so if there's any error in where the target is, then they'll miss, but they're certainly going to give it a shot. There's something like four gigabytes worth of data storage on the spacecraft and they've basically filled it all up. All right, Ben, thanks for joining us. It was uh, a fun to have a little chat about this. Um, 
we're going to release a video today just just for Ultima Thule because it's the the big news. Now, um, what is your YouTube channel called? Um, it's youtube.com slash c slash where is Roadster, which is for the Tesla Roadster that I became famous for tracking. Yep. And I'll definitely if you'll come back with us, uh, we'll talk about that more in depth uh, next time. Yep. Sure thing. Thanks, Ben. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video.